Hi, I'm Elliot Margulies. I'm with the Midpen Media Center. We serve East Palo Alto, Menlo Park, Palo Alto, and Atherton. And during this pandemic, we've been doing some recordings on Zoom because our TV studio is closed down. And if you were to look at our YouTube channel, you'd see some recordings where people talk about the impacts of the pandemic and the changes to their roles. There's a group of teachers who talk, there's a group of clergy leaders who talk, but today we're joined by a number of leaders who are gonna share their experiences and their insights about the disproportionate impacts of the pandemic on low-income communities and communities of color in East Palo Alto and Bell Haven. Whether we're talking about childcare or social distancing or health and testing and rents and food and uh, job security, the impacts are very, very challenging and different for some in the Silicon Valley. So uh, whether you're watching this at home and, and saying to yourself, uh, yep, that's what my family has to deal with, or whether you're watching it and saying, wow, I'm so glad I'm not dealing with that challenge or that challenge. In either case, I hope you feel the connection of being a neighbor with a lot of people with different experiences and hopefully a calling to help your neighbors out over the next few months. So I'm going to introduce, uh, we have a, a, quite a number of participants today. And when I say your name, just give a wave so people at home know who's who. We have uh, Barry Hathaway, the Executive Director of Job Train, Barry. We have Nevada Butler, the founder and former ED of Ecumenical Hunger Program, Nevada. Uh, we have Sarai Espinosa Salamanca, who founded the Dreamers Roadmap. And we have Heather Starnes Logwood, who's the ED of Live in Peace. Uh, we have Father Goody from the um, St. Francis of Assisi Church in East Palo Alto. We have Kate Bradshaw. She's a reporter now with the Mountain View Voice, but she did an important study she's going to talk about in a little bit. And we have Maya Altman, who is the CEO of Health Plan San Mateo. We also have with us uh, Ina Figueroa, who's actually been a client of the Ecumenical Hunger Program. And we have uh, Doreen Hoos, who is joining Nevada at the Ecumenical Hunger Program office at the same computer. And that's it for today. So uh, we'll start right away with uh, our questions. I, I imagine, you know, especially anybody who's been laid off, uh, rent is a bigger and bigger issue for a lot of households. So um, I know that both uh, Sarai and also Heather have been part of a very uh, inspiring in uh, initiative I, I should mention Mary Jane Marcus was part of it too. Uh, Sarai, you wanna start us off? Definitely, hello everybody. Thank you, Elliot, for inviting us to have this conversation with you and community members. And thank you to everybody on this call for doing the work that you're doing. Um, at the end of the day, this is a collective effort and um, everybody's input and everybody's work is extremely important to help these families through this pandemic. Um, so yeah, just a little bit of context behind these, this collaboration. Um, this campaign is called First of the Month. It's in collaboration with uh, Caffeinia, Dreamers Roadmap, and Live in Peace. And as y'all uh, will meet soon, Heather will talk about um, how we all got involved. But basically, just a conversation with Mary Jane and I on our end. Um, we were trying to have a conversation around like a civic engagement, the pandemic hit and we switched gears to trying to focus on what was going to be the biggest need uh, for our community. And I still live in East Palo Alto. So for me, it was kind of a no brainer. I'm like, I know it's going to be rent. We sent out like a survey for like maybe, maybe like 20 ish, 20 people responded to it. 
and it was definitely like food and rent were the biggest uh, stressors for people um and we started kind of like thinking okay so you guys live in palo alto you guys have access to a lot of people with privilege um i live in east palo alto i know a lot of people who need the support um let's kind of bridge those two um resources and and groups and support people with rent and then we were introduced to heather at live in peace who already had that mechanism in place for her nonprofit. And I believe they had also sent out a survey and got a similar response and Heather can speak more on, on that. To this day, we've helped um, 318 families uh, with rent assistance. Um, it's just a super humbling experience to be part of this team. It's been a very, like Sari said, a very humbling um, it, I have a friend who's on the board of Nuestra Castro, but she, her sister is an uh, ep epidemiologist. And so she's, she was like, man, this stuff is real. This stuff is real. Um, and so we were, because of her, we were, we shut down a week before the county did um, just to get our um, bearings with all the online stuff. And, and we had sent out a, we had prepared a, a survey and so right when the county shut down we had already written a survey and we'd send it out to 300 of our uh, students and families and so we knew right away jobs were being lost um, and there was an instability that was a tidal wave rolling down and so uh, we had a few donors kind of kick in early just about a hundred thousand that we were working with and Sadi called and I think what was two of the best things that's come out of this is really working um, like this with other organizations really fluid really um, uh, because we're like-minded and I think uh, we they talked about uh, how hard it is for for people to get access to these funds that are out there uh, we are turning around money in 48 hours uh, we have lists and lists that of people that we have and that um, we started with our inner networks first um, so we have served 318 families but it's for three months of rent so uh, our our real purpose was that we would uh, stabilize families not just give them so we give full rent we give it three months um, and at this point we're we're in phase we're we're completing phase one and we're going back and making sure that everybody's stabilized and if they need another month we would talk about that it's it's just crazy to to see how families are living like we have families that uh, 10 people live in a one bedroom apartment with like people just like literally sleeping in rows in the living room. And yes, they are also the essential workers, you know, brown and black people don't have the luxury of working from home and still getting paid their normal salaries. Therefore, they do not have the choice to stay home. They have to go out to try to make any ends meet. A lot of them got their hours cut back. So they're working less hours. So they still can't make their, their rent. Um, so that's kind of the situation of a lot of the families that we're supporting through Live in Peace, right? And we have documented and we have undocumented people um, who did not get any stimulus check, who does not qualify for unemployment. And even if they did get unemployment and a stimulus check, there it's still not enough, right, to make ends meet because of the volume of dependents that they have. But with my grandkids, the ones that stays with me, I have right now, we have seven. Se seven grandchildren Very living good. with you? Yeah, that uh -huh. are living with me. And so you, you're able to help with getting all the food you need at the yeah. ecumenical yeah. hunger. Yes, uh, my husband hasn't been working uh, because of the COVID, but... Um, Did he get I, laid I, off? Uh, no, he didn't get laid off. He just, uh, it wasn't, they just got a shutdown. Mm -hmm. And um, they're not they're not open yet. He's in sales, so um, nobody to sell to. <laughs> and uh, is how's your husband doing uh, with the not working? Um, I think we find things to do with the kids. I think we really enjoy the fact that we're together. 
So that uh, was what you said about some blessings, even in the midst yes, of yes. hard times. Yes. I was walking my dogs early April, and um, I don't want to cry, but uh, I saw my neighbor, and he said, don't come near me. And I said, Jorge, where you been? I haven't, you know, because we kind of, our street, uh, in, I live in East Palo our street's very, uh, we always check on everybody. And he said, don't come near me. My, my family has COVID. And he's like, I just had to come out to my car. And I was like, what? And um, so we were standing across the street talking and his wife had it and was very sick. Um, and he had to be off work because it was a potential that he could get it. Um, but he was also glad, I mean, he was taking care of her, but she ended up having it for four weeks, uh, um, four and a half weeks. And then he had to take another two weeks after that to uh, make sure to be quarantined. So that entire time, everybody in his house had um, not been able to go to work because, um, so I said, brother, you know, we, I put him on, it was early on. We still, we didn't have this huge waiting list yet, but I said, brother, we got you. Uh, you will make sure we cover your rent, you know? And um, he wept and mostly because of the, the trauma of having the disease and being uh, so fearful for his wife and his daughter. But then on top of it, just not knowing where rent would come from. And um, we had an emergency kind of case happened literally last week. Um, I drove over to Heather's house, told her about this. Uh, he's a single father from Central America seeking asylum. His landlord was about to kick him out. It's a renter of a renter, as was mentioned earlier. Um, because technically the rent moratorium is over. So she gave him 10 days into June to pay the rent or she was going to kick him out. He doesn't have a car. So if he was kicked out, he didn't even have a car to sleep in with his son. They had been eating fruit only for the past three months because they had to walk to food pantries. And by the time they got there, they only had fruit left. So just like, I don't know, like, you know, like that, those kinds of stories is what I like it. It, like I don't know it takes me back like I'm like I just can't believe that in the backyard of Silicon Valley families are living like this like it's unacceptable you know like and just like the country as a whole right like we kind of pride ourselves on like America is like so wealthy and so prosperous and what whatnot but yet in the backyard of every big rich city there's this group of people brown and black almost always that keep that city running right because of these people these cities are running and when these types of things hit they're the first ones that are forgotten we distribute food to elders and to people with covid also and so we were able to drop our food to them regularly um and that's to me what the community that's what east palo alto does over and over and we just have been able to be a part of that um and just when you talk about stabilizing families you know there's it's dark the instability of food and rent the combination and the stress of also being overcrowded we pay fifteen hundred dollars for a family of four who live in a bedroom and you know for them to all be home um it's not meant to be that it's meant for some kids to go to school at one point uh, somebody to be at work and the shifting and moving around so with everybody stuck and the fear of the unknown being undocumented uh the food and the rent it's um there's definitely two experiences happening you know in the world in the united states for sure of covid there's um and we're We've been blessed to, we've not only just been blessed to be neighbors, but to actually have solutions to for a lot of it has been very uh, humbling. I'd like to talk a bit about the uh, challenges to an undocumented family. Are there some unique things uh, along with what, what kind of assistance an undocumented family can expect to find? So uh, I'll, let me first call on uh, Miriam who uh, is the executive director from Nuestra Casa. And could you say just a, a little bit about, uh, for a moment, what is Nuestra Casa usually doing? And then talk about the undocumented population with any examples you can share. 
I am the executive director of Nuestra Casa, and Nuestra Casa is a community-based organization based in East Palo Alto, and over the past 18 years, we have uh, been serving the communities in the Mid-Peninsula and helping the most vulnerable community members via programs that are focused on leadership development, education, and advocacy. At the community level, we're also noticing that there's still a fear, a fear from um, community members, particularly the undocumented population, and seeking healthcare access and getting tested. There are fears that if they go get tested, their information will then be tied to their record. So I'm definitely noticing a fear there. Even before the pandemic, um, individuals were still hesitant about accessing services at our local health clinic. And it was for the fact that um, they, they feared that their information would be kept and records. And also there's also hope, the hope that at one point there will be an amnesty to support the undocumented um, individuals. And they fear that if they can prove that they're not dependent on a social services, it will put them in a better position down the road. So they actually try to avoid getting help just to look like they're independent, like they're not using government funds. And when it comes to employment opportunities, the number one challenge that is impacting the undocumented population at the moment is the fact that they are not able to receive unemployment benefits. My husband, unfortunately, is still undocumented. So we haven't been able to receive any funding from anywhere besides the pandemic, um, EBT pandemic, it's called. So did you um, say that your husband uh, was still able to work or not? No, no, he hasn't been able to work he hopefully hopefully he'll go back to work he was called by his boss saying that he may be able to go they that his job site may be opening up this friday so he's been out of work for how long now since march father goody uh you have a uh thriving church in uh in east palo alto i'm sure your congregants uh, range all over the map, uh, but that you probably have some who are undocumented. What are some of the stories you're hearing that make it even more challenging if you're undocumented or you're homeless? Many of them are not able to access any of those, uh, those services or, those, or the, the money that others are getting. So um, it's basically no work, and no money to pay their rent. And we've had a lot of people coming here to the church looking for help. Many times the persons are renters renting from other renters. So they don't have contracts, they don't have receipts, and so it makes it very difficult. And, uh, but not impossible. Has, there, there's ways of dealing with it, and that's what we're trying to do right now for the people that are coming to us. So we're, we're, how do you help them? Did you say you're actually trying to talk to their landlords or how, are, how else are you helping? I've done that. I, I asked the, the, the lady who's coming at 5.30 to give me the name of the landlord and I, I will call him. I'll talk to him on the phone and explain to him that no, no work, no, no pay, no money to pay the rent. And, and I mean, it's, it should be kind of an obvious um, thing that, and this lady had always paid her rent on time never had a problem before the pandemic and so um that's part of it i've even gone to the house of the owner that that was getting and and uh, was being getting getting the money and uh, and, and and explained to them their their uh their, their obligations and legal obligations that, that they have for the people that they're running to and uh, a lot of it's education and and uh, and, and also I've, I've I've encouraged people who have been working all the time to be looking out and for the people who are not working to be able to help them out because uh, a lot of them are they're, they're they're they've always done their best to 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 carry their their burden but 
they're unable to do it, to do it now. And, and but other people have been working right straight through the pandemic. They can be a big help to others who are not uh, able to pay their rent. So. There's a lot of misinformation that goes out. I, I'm just totally surprised. I have a friend that I thought was really together. She started out by telling me blacks wouldn't get COVID, okay? They didn't get it in Africa. I, I just could not believe this woman who I thought had it all together. That information we need to change. Don't go and get the testing. If you do the testing, they're going to shoot the virus in you. The government has set this up to give. That information is out there. And for many of us as leaders, we have got to try to educate people and change that because it does not make any sense. But that information is still out there. And this is why you don't see a lot. And I'm speaking now mainly of Blacks that I see that tell me this, that that's why they don't go and get tested and um, still come out without a mask on. I said, well, did you see all the deaths there in New York? Did you see the, the, you could see the arms and legs of those people. They were black. Oh, that's just a gimmick. They're doing that as a gimmick. Did you see all the burials where they were doing mass grave? They say that's all just a um, bunch of junk. And so trying to encourage, let them know that this is real. I wanna switch our focus uh, to job security and insecurity. Uh, and uh, Barry Hathaway is here, and he's the executive director of Job Train. So I'd like you to say just very briefly what Job Train normally does. And I don't know if you're able to do any of it now. Let us know. But I know that you're in touch with many of your graduates, and I'm wondering uh, what's happened to them. What are you seeing amongst uh, people that have gone through training for vocations? through job train and during this COVID crisis? Job train is an organization that exists to help people who are adults um, start uh, jobs and career pathways that can offer them the opportunity to earn enough money to live well in the Bay Area. Um, we have done a number of surveys of our clients as well, like so many of the organizations here. And similarly, we're finding that so many of our, our graduates have lost jobs since the COVID crisis. Um, and, and in a disproportionately large amount compared to the sort of air, the, the, the general population. So we know that communities of color, low income communities, which unfortunately tend to be communities of color, are losing their jobs and are out their impact on the COVID crisis or from the COVID crisis is really outsized for them. Um, we are, we had to put a pause on our healthcare pathway on our construction trades pathway and on our culinary arts pathway, uh, but we did continue our tech pathway and have graduated students that have a new class coming in. You know, whether the jobs are here now in this moment, they're going to be back and we're hoping that people will engage in training to help them be ready for when the jobs come back. This week, we started back up our construction trades class and we started back up our, our both of our healthcare the medical assistant and the certified nursing assistant classes are back online. They're meeting virtually for lecture and they're gonna be coming in in July in a socially distance appropriate way to get their labs done. So are you in touch with people that are asking job train for any help at this point? Uh, what do you do if you, some of your graduates are really in trouble? Yeah, so like, um, like several organizations here, we did launch what we call a crisis relief fund almost right away. Now, this was not something that job train had done in the past, that is to, create, to give cash payments to people who need them for essential living expenses, but we did turn a, a crisis relief fund on. Um, it is right now available only to job train students and graduates, um, but we are helping people with rent and food and, um, paying their bills. Heather, say just a line or two about what Live in Peace normally does. Uh, Live in Peace uh, it comes out of the violence, um, the era of violence, and Live in Peace versus Rest in Peace. And we, um, our tagline is empowering youth to reclaim their future. Um, and uh, we talk about seeing yourself in the future. And so we pretty much work, we have life coaches and folks um, that we walk along with. And Two of the people here today are looking at things from a health perspective. 
And one of them, Kate Bradshaw, received a grant when she was a reporter, as she still is, but to do a study of how health uh, is different depending on what your zip code is and your quality of life around health. So I'd like Kate, uh, I know your study was done before COVID ever came around, but could you summarize some of what you think still applies? So my reporting project was with the um, USC Annenberg Center for Health Journalism. And what I explored was really trying to understand um, the uh, reason behind um, one of these very startling health statistics I learned, which is that the life expectancy for people who live in Atherton is 19 years longer than for people who live in East Palo Alto. And that's um, based on data from the San Mateo County Health Department. Is there anything that ties into uh, why COVID can be more deadly? You know, in San Mateo County, um, about 46% of all of the cases that have been identified are among Latino and Hispanic residents. Um, that same community represents only about 24% of the, the population. So that's disproportionately way higher. We also have Maya Altman with us, and she's the CEO of uh, Health Plan San Mateo. And I'd like to hear your take on the statistics that Kate mentioned and what you're finding in terms of health disparities between uh, more wealthy and more low income areas. So just to unmute yourself, tell us briefly what is uh, Health Plan San Mateo also? Yes, hi. Um, uh, so the Health Plan San Mateo is a, um, a health insurance plan. It's a public health insurance plan. And um, we provide uh, insurance for people on Medi-Cal in the county of San Mateo. We also have a Medicare program for um, about 9,000 people that also have Medicaid. And so those are people who are low income and older and for the most part, or maybe have a disability that qualifies them for Medicare. So we have about 136,000 members or participants. Um, we also um, help the county run its program for people who are undocumented and so that therefore don't qualify for Medi-Cal. Um, so uh, we've been around for about 30 years. So by definition, everybody that's part of our program is low income. We have noticed that similar to other diseases, the Latino community members are at most risk. Many of our community members do have underlying conditions such as diabetes and um, other conditions that um, are, make them more susceptible to the virus. Yeah, the biggest impact are these other things, income inequality, environmental um, situations, housing shortages, you know, living in poverty. Those are the things that impact health the most. So that's an important thing to remember. There is um, this map that's called the Cal Enviro screen that um, basically looks at the environmental health hazards of um, the area. And you see that in you know, the neighborhoods that are um, not just lower income, but also predominantly you know, Hispanic and Latino and African American do experience greater environmental health problems. And, Part of this research was tying that to like specific examples of racism in the history of our communities. What are some of those environment uh, factors? Um, so things like you look at where are the dumps in the Bay Area, most of them are along the Bay. Um, you look at, you know, where are the highways um, that have the most traffic and those, you know, in several instances, especially around this area, um, are you know concentrated in those lower income neighborhoods. Um, the Bellhaven neighborhood hadn't had a city council representative for 30 years until um, just a couple of years ago they drew districts and actually you know have an assigned representative. Can you tell us what some of these uh, environmental issues lead to in terms of, of diseases? The rate of asthma in East Palo Alto is about three times the county average. 
Um, and, you know, there are a number of uh, factors that go into that, but one of them um, is potentially the presence of, you know, greater particulate matter in the air from these highways and from the traffic. I think it's more of an issue of disinvestment across the board, not just in healthcare. So it's economic investment, it's housing and investment, because I think all those factors actually have a bigger impact on healthcare than having a clinic. I mean, there is a wonderful clinic in uh, East Palo Alto, uh, Bell, um, uh, um, Ravenswood Family Health Center. Um, the county has a clinic in North Fair Oaks. Um, you know, I think access to healthcare is okay. It could be better. But I think the bigger is, I think the bigger issue is just overall investments in these communities. The other thing I just wanted to point out is, is really um, a problem for um, our older and members and people with disabilities. You know, many of our members live alone and they're really isolated. They can't leave their homes or they, you know, and they're really scared to leave their homes. So um, finding programs and the community has done a wonderful job. We've asked for volunteers to write dear neighbor letters to our members. So I think it's really important to try to connect to, to older people and people with disabilities who really can't get out. You know, delivering food. Food has been a, the biggest issue that has been reported, getting access to food. We did hear from uh, Doreen and Ina about the ways that they've depended on the ecumenical hunger program for food, and I know you've been doing this for many, many years. Uh, what has, is different now with, since the COVID virus? And given that you're calling people up uh, about, can they use some toys? I'm, I'm imagining that you've talked to a lot of families. So what are some of the things you're hearing these days, Nevada? You know, Thank you for having us. I, I mean, I'm really excited about this, Elliot, and and it just re really feels good. And I think I'm listening to Heather, and I'm almost sure she worked on a case that I've been working on. I'm almost sure that you're the one that was an angel to somebody. I, I, I want to share, I'll get back to that family. This is my, my neighbor. I, I live on a block um, where it's very diverse. And um, you hear a lot of the stories. I've been home because um, I'm old. <laughs> As I say, I'm old, I'm a diabetic, and I have reactive asthma. So everybody here was afraid for me to be here at this office. Even though I'm back now working three days a week, they're going to put a shield around my desk. I had my mask on, and I've got the helmet thing, too, going on. But I had a neighbor that was having a lot of problems with rent. She was a beautician. The two brothers worked in restaurants and no, been laid off since early March. And it's been really hard for them. One of my neighbors, I have another one that did construction work, laid off from work. So we've been bringing food out and trying to get them. This family never asked for help before. They pay a lot of money for rent almost 4,000 a month for rent. And um, we were able to get them help and I've been working with her on getting help with the rent. And she had gone so many times to this one place, did all the applications and everything, two months, still had got, hadn't got any help. And she ended up hearing about another place here in East Palo Alto and was able to go there and she called me in tears saying they helped me with my rent. There's a language barrier. She speaks pretty good English. I speak a very little Spanish, but um, she couldn't tell me the name of the organization. She knew where they were, but she couldn't tell me the name, so I'm sure it was you. I, and I didn't say, I was the executive director for Ecumenical Hunger for 28 years. And now I work in the warehouse, I give out furniture, beds, toys, <laughs> whatever people donate. And I just want to share, uh, I'm all excited. I'm kind of half cocked today because before I came to this meeting, we got a donation of, I think, 200 mattresses, new in the box. Okay. And I'm so excited. And I've got people coming at four to start picking up. So if you know families that need mattresses, have them to call me and get on the list because I'm all excited about that. And I have a woman that was a battered woman that was here this morning. She's picking up a mattress. She finally found housing after being homeless for quite a while. And this is a senior. 
So she's going to take a mattress and we're trying to figure out how to get her up off the floor because she says it's very hard to do that. We're actually open only three days a week and probably out there by now, the cars are coming through. They're loading the food in the cars. And I'm constantly calling people saying, if you really need food, come by and get whatever we have. They'll load it in the cars and you don't even have to get out. They're wearing face masks. They ask you to wear one. They load the food up and send you out. Back to my family that got help with the rent. I could not believe this landlord. She wants to cut the house in half and put this family in the garage and rent the other part out because she wants to make more money, even with everything that's going on, which is just unbelievable. They have a, a little daughter that's about eight or nine years old. And I just can't, cannot believe anybody would be heartless enough to do that. But that's what that woman wants to do. But along with that, the good things that have happened, we had a family that the refrigerator went out, a very large, I think 13 people in the family. And I had a donor, we, we put the word out, I had a donor that bought the refrigerator, paid for it. All they had to do was pick it up from airport appliances. And we had the same thing happen with the washer and dryer. So there's been a lot of good things and people wanting to do good things for some of the families that are in need. Well, thank you for all your fabulous work and energy. What are your hopes? What, what do you hope comes out of all of this uh, uh, experience that has impacted East Palo Alto and Bell Haven residents so enormously uh, in so many different arenas. And what are what would be your ask for the community at large, for the state, for the country, uh, or or your own community uh, as we look at the coming months and years? So I know that's a lot. Uh, and I just want you to, uh, if there's something in your mind about that, raise your hand and, uh, and, and give us your thoughts. Yes, Barry. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's very hopeful about what's happening now is that in all of the, the sort of recovery conversations that we're hearing, there is an understanding and, and, a, and a desire to focus these efforts on communities of color. Finally, we're not debating anymore that that communities of color are um, are there's an equity and inclusion issue in our in our nation and in the Bay Area that needs to be addressed. And all of the places where I'm being asked to participate, um, equity, inclusion, and human rights are a through line for all of it. I hope that we can keep ourselves on this track. So when it comes to hope, I really feel that we have a very unique opportunity, particularly in Silicon Valley, to really work across multiple sectors and really work with the corporate sector, the government sector, the nonprofit sector, to really uh, together build the new future that we want to see, particularly in the Bay Area and really be able to address a lot of these um, issues concerning equity. I think when East Palo Alto was founded um, as, a, as a community incorporated, it really sent a message to the surrounding communities that, uh, that, that we, were on, 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 we, we were on the same level as all of them, uh, but lacked all the, the, uh, the resources. And, and uh, I think that's, that, that's probably the, the greatest challenge right now, we have all this people, all, all kinds of people now that are, are, are friendly to the low income people. And, but I think we have to make sure that they, that they, they follow through with, uh, with resources and, and uh, provide for people of low income to not be people of low income when they're doing uh, the, the essential labor in, in our communities. And, but they, but they're being left out uh, the, um, minimum wage won't do it in the bay area right thank you so much father and heather i hope people remember who was considered essential um and what that means you know women and and people that cleaned uh hotel rooms they're they're reporting out now that that's who saved the people's lives that were in having covid because they took time to speak to people the people that delivered food um, to our neighbors in Atherton 
Alto and our neighbors in Palo Alto, the people that, that worked at, that drove trucks, the people that worked in grocery stores, all the things really expose what is going on in the fabric of and the world, but the Silicon Valley. And so I agree. I think we, we need to uh, launch a campaign that talks about pay our essential workers, you know, teachers too, I, a lot of teachers, but, um, but that we're paying our essential, what, what was exposed as essential. It wasn't the football players. It wasn't these people that are getting multi-million dollar contracts. It was the humble people that really had no choice, but they showed up uh, to keep their house and they did it with a smile and they did it uh, before anybody even knew what was really going on. So I, I just, the fabric has been exposed and I, I think we need to launch a campaign about what that means while people's hearts are still soft. Like how do we pay people more? How do we make sure people have a living wage? And I hope that people are willing to go with less so that our essential can go with enough. I think I take two things out of this. One is, well, one big thing, which is we're all connected and everything is connected. So I'm really um, heartened by the stories of community and people stepping up. Um, East Palo Alto has always been a really remarkable community, but that's, it shows even, the showcases even more what a strong community is. And I think the, um, the, uh, the level of volunteerism is, is very um, heartening to see across the county. Um, and I think when I say everything is connected, you know, we can't disconnect health and poverty and housing and food. Um, we have to tackle all of them together. And um, we really need um, strong federal and state leadership to do that, as well as local leadership. So my last message is be sure to vote. Thank you, Maya. And Nevada, let's hear your thoughts. I hope when we come out of this that we don't forget that we're all the same. We continue to support one another. I, I think, and for the jobs that are lost, and I'm told, like my neighbors, they don't even know if their jobs will be there when this is over with. I hope other jobs will become available and be available for people, whether they have their social security cards or not, you know, be available and that we don't forget one another. You know, um, we're all one, and this disease did not care who you were. I want to thank everybody for their eloquence, for what they were willing to share today, and I think for a lot of us, uh, we realize that if, if you're living without much money or, or no income for this period of the COVID, um, your very ability to survive is putting it, put into question and the challenges are, are huge. The stresses I can't even imagine. So if, if you're able to give, uh, these are all agencies you'll be able to see on the screen uh, where you can make a donation. Uh, and if you are able to, there's plenty of other agencies locally and also at the county level uh, we hope everybody will give, and, and maybe in the long run, we do take this moment to address the broader issues that, that generate these inequities. So thank you so much for being part of this discussion. Good night.